Hello, this is the Fiction Nonfiction Podcast from Literary Hub, where we believe that every issue in your Twitter feed or on the evening news has already been tackled somewhere in literature. I'm Whitney Terrell, the author of the novel, The Good Lieutenant. And I'm Vivi Ganeshanathan, also known as Sugi, author of the novel, Love Marriage. So the last few episodes uh, of the show have, in one way or other, focused on the war in Ukraine or Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And more generally, which both of us uh, write about, that's true, but both of our, our we we both have connections to war, but our, our connections to war are actually pretty different. Um, I write about the Sri Lankan civil war because of my family's connections to that history, but you actually went to Iraq as a reporter. And sometimes listening to you, I've tried to imagine what that was like. How did you imagine it before you went and how is it different from what you pictured? Well, we actually are going to talk about a lot about that in this upcoming interview. And so I'll, uh, there's a part in it where I will, I will talk about that. You know, it was not at all what I'd thought that it would be, and it was quite, the thing that I actually found most frightening about being a reporter and about war generally is how mundane it seems when you're at risk of dying, like how boring it is. Um, and, and yet you understand there's an existential risk in this moment, sitting on this bus, on this particular road where you, I mean, Iraq was in particular kind of war where the greatest risk was from roadside bombs. And so those were random. There wasn't anything that you could do to sort of, there were some things, but there, you, you know, there was still a roll of the dice there. It wasn't like if you had been super prepared, you would be safe. You know, there was a, there was a randomness that, that I thought was, that was shocking. So we're, you know, being in a war is a situation where a, a writer confronts the limits of what they can control. And that's what's happening right now in Ukraine. I mean, we have had Multiple journalists killed there recently. It's going, there are going to be more journalists killed there. Journalists are being targeted, I think, specifically in Ukraine because Putin doesn't want images of the war to get out, you know? And so we have developed a show today to talk about the risks of reporting in conflict and what some of those journalists in Ukraine are facing now. And we have a fantastic guest here to discuss us, to discuss the topic with us. Putsada Reng is an author and journalist whose work has appeared in the New York Times, Politico, The Guardian, Ms., The Seattle Times, and the San Jose Mercury News, among others. Putsada was born in Cambodia and raised in rural Oregon, surrounded by berry farms when she and her family hustled to earn their middle-class existence. Putsada has lived and worked in more than a dozen countries, including Cambodia, Afghanistan, and Thailand. In 2005, she received an Alicia Patterson Journalism Fellowship that took her back to Cambodia to report on landless farmers. Her forthcoming memoir, which will be published in May by MCD Books, is called Ma and Me. Its story explores the displacement experienced by children of refugees and the emotional exile that comes with being gay. It also includes Putsada's time as a journalist and as a journalism trainer in Afghanistan. Putsada, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Sugi. I'm such a fan of your guys' show that this is such an honor to be here. Thank you. Um, that's very kind. Um, so Putsada, I know you've been thinking about the journalists covering the invasion of Ukraine. You and I were emailing a little bit before this interview. And several days ago, um, Brent Renaud, a filmmaker, was killed in Ukraine. He was working on a film for Time Studios, the studios affiliated with Time Media that publishes Time Magazine. And then more recently, there were two Fox News journalists, uh, Pierre Zakruski and Sasha Kovshnyova, who were killed outside of Kyiv. And Sasha, who was Ukrainian, was only 24 years old. Uh, Zakruski was 55 and had worked in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. And it seems to me like the job of foreign correspondent has gotten steadily more dangerous over the past, say, decade and change. And I wonder if, if that sounds right to you and how you think Ukraine fits into that picture. You know, it's hard for me to say whether increasingly foreign journalists are at greater risk or that, that the work that we do is more dangerous because certainly there, were, there was a lot of danger when, say for example, Elizabeth Becker was in my own country in Cambodia, trying to cover the communist Khmer Rouge regime in 1977, two years after the Khmer Rouge took over. And there was a scene in the book she wrote uh, later from that experience when the war was over, where she talks about an armed gunman entering the hotel room where she and two other journalists were staying and the only and, and he started shooting and the only way she survived was by hiding in a bathtub. And so I don't know if this is a situation where the journalists that we're hearing about now, uh, that, that these are just more high profile cases and that's why we're hearing about them 
or whether this danger has just has always existed, but perhaps we haven't heard uh, to this extent or to this level um, of, of journalists dying on the job uh, working overseas. And, you know, certainly one of the things I will say is that no doubt about it, being a foreign correspondent anywhere in the world at this moment in time is extremely risky. Uh, you know, I, th I think a lot about, you, you know, you talked, Suki, about, um, you know, the dangers, particularly within the, within the past decade. And for me, I, I would even dare say the past couple of decades, because if we, if we go all the way back to Daniel Pearl, who died in 2002, when he was lured by Islamic militants into a trap um, and uh, eventually brutally murdered, at that time, I was a young journalist at the San Jose Mercury News, already with ideas that I wanted to become a foreign correspondent. And when the news of, of Daniel Pearl uh, came out, it, it certainly gave me pause, but it also in, in some way kind of hardened my resolve to go do this kind of work because it's so important and so critical that journalists shine a spotlight on, on these very dark corners um, of the world. And then I think about you know, just more recently, you know, we have the case, I, I heard uh, Jason Rezaian, who was picked up in uh, Iran, uh, working there as the bureau chief for Tehran for the Washington Post. And he was there for 550, 544 days, I think is what it was. Now, luckily in his situation, he was released, he's alive and well. But that fate did, does not pertain to, that fate didn't happen to, to other journalists. I'm thinking of Jamal Khashoggi, who uh, was brutally murdered in, or assassinated in 2018 at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. And again, a situation where he was lured to the consulate. When Marie Colvin, who was reporting for the Sunday London Times, um, died in a bomb blast in Syria in, to, in 2012, I was working in Cambodia at the time off and on and um, her death really shook me to my core because of course she, she's been a legend as a, as a foreign correspondent. Um, and so I think we can, we can point to these very high profile cases in which journalists working abroad have been killed. I think it's just harder, it's harder for me, um, you know, having come from that background and, and, and coming from that world to, to actually, you know, look at the data and say for, for certain whether, whether our work has becoming increasingly hazardous or whether this is just kind of part of, part of the deal when, when one chooses to be a foreign correspondent, that, that there are inherent dangers that exist. I feel like it has become more hazardous. Uh, I, I, there's a, I remember finding this report that I looked up from the Committee to Protect Journalists that they were looking at Iraq between 2003 and 2011, when, which was a time that I was there. They reported that 150 journalists and 54 media support workers were killed during that period of time. And then a different report from, uh, had slightly different numbers from Reporters Without Borders said that they had it put the number at 230 people between 2003 and 2010. And they said that was more journalists have been killed in any war since World War II. I mean, I feel like it's because increasingly, and this is happening in Ukraine, journalists are becoming targets, right? It's a problem for Putin that the journalists are there filming this. He would like it to stop, you know? And I think that that is one of the reasons that it is becoming more, more dangerous. I, I absolutely agree with you. What I think that there used to be a time when journalists were considered um, sort of off limits when it comes to war zones and conflict zones. I don't know that that's any longer the case. Um, you know, for what I was speaking to particularly was a foreign journalist. I was thinking of through the lens of American journalists, particularly working abroad or European journalists working abroad. However, um, to your point on the data from Committee to Protect Journalists, if we are to take just journalists as a category internationally working in conflict zones, absolutely. The number of deaths and the number of journalists who've been targeted has increased. And Iraqi and, journalists were, were targeted. You know, I knew Iraqi journalists who, who had left the country because they felt like they were, their lives were at risk and others who did die. Right. And that's actually happening in, in Afghanistan right now as the Taliban uh, have regained control over Afghanistan. 
mentioned Jason Resign earlier, and um, if I'm memory serves, he's actually Iranian American, and so there is also um, right. That's a very interesting position to be in because you have folks who, like yourself, you know, going back to report in a place perhaps where you have family history or connections or. Um, you're presenting in a different way. And that seems like a whole different category. So it seems like there was a period of time when journalists were considered sort of um, precious and, you know, one did not want to appear to be targeting them. Then there was a period of time where maybe um, there were, nobody wanted to, um, people were care caring less about whether they were, they were sort of a precious set of folks or not, but, but weren't necessarily targeting them. And weren't now the Fox, it does. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, just, just, and now, and now it just they seems in like, a car that said press on it. Weren't they in a press car? They were. The and and I mean, okay. and anyone who you see reporting from Ukraine, or at least I've noticed this, um, I'm just watching the news. I feel like I'm, I'm watching people report in helmets that say press really large. And actually when I have seen coverage from other places around the world in other years, I haven't necessarily seen that. I feel like these signs are getting bigger and bigger, sort of like, like almost like this visual cue of increasing alarm um, because Putin is not going to consider um, necessarily, right? Um, whether someone is a journalist or not. And, and I mean, it's not just the question of, I'm not going to target you intentionally. There's there there's the next level, which is I will target you intentionally as you, as you note, or like I will force you to leave the country, which is what, you know, like the, the Sri Lankan government, um, you know, had many journalists leave at the end of the war. Um, so they're like all of these, these different levels of, of um, respect or, and then the actual journalists turning into active targets seems like a completely different level. And you also mentioned, um, yeah, Marie Colvin, who's a total legend, um, who had also covered Sri Lanka and who, as I recall, had lost an eye. Um, mm -hmm. Hey, this is Whitney. I was we stopped for just a second because I wanted to check and see whether that Fox car had clearly been marked. And the news reports that we're reading don't say that it was marked as pressed. So we're gonna real time fact check that and say we don't know for sure if that car was marked as press. But while we're on the subject, I've noticed that it seems like many of the people in the most danger are photographers and videographers, which is connected to that idea that Putin especially doesn't want images of this shown, right, to the to the broader public and, and to the Russian population, of course, is why he shut down all the media in Russia. Um, do you think changes in how the news is read and disseminated have also changed who is in danger in a war zone like this? Absolutely. I think it's so much easier for writers to hide. For photographers and videographers, they're carrying their gear with them. And so immediately that makes them a target. I also can't help but think of the photograph that Lindsay Adario of the New York Times did, this iconic image of a mother and her two young children, a girl and a boy, who were killed in a bomb blast in a suburb just outside of Kyiv. When I think about all of the days of news that I've consumed, whether it's via TV news or radio or newspaper or blogs or what have you, what is the thing that stays with me? It's images. And I think that that's true for a lot of people. Images stay with us long after we have seen them as opposed to say, you know, a long think piece in the New Yorker or in the New York Times. That's not to say that writing no longer has a place and that, and that you know, only images are telling the story. That's, that's not the case at all. But I do think that because of where we are in our society right now and how we consume news, and how fast news is made via social media, whether that's TikTok or Instagram or other kinds of social media, uh, that our, our attention span as a species, you know, a society has really declined. And so in that sense, it absolutely is harder, I think, and more dangerous for photographers and videographers in this scenario of operating in a conflict zone. Because for somebody like me as a writer, as a journalist, Though I would want to be there um, at the scene, as opposed to doing armchair journalism, I don't necessarily have to be. And I can report from afar, which is actually what a lot of uh, forum-based journalists in Russia are now doing out of Ist Istanbul, um, just, to get out of, just to get out of the fray and to, and to get out of Moscow. Um, and so they're doing the best we, they can to report on the news uh, from a distance you know, while keeping themselves safe. And so, you know, for, for those of us who operate with words as opposed to pictures, um, I, I, there's a little bit more safety, I think, in that. 
interesting because like kind of of course like the old school stereotype of like the swashbuckling white man war correspondent um you know facing danger with his notebook in his hand um this is really kind of the opposite you you were both mentioning before kind of alluding to your friends who are local journalists um in um Afghanistan and Iraq um and their increased level of danger there which is also something that I've observed in Sri Lanka um, and I was reading that when Pierre Zakrukski worked in Afghanistan, he worked to help freelancers and their families leave the country after the U.S. troop withdrawal. And Patsad, I know you have a lot of opinions on the U.S. troop withdrawal. And you'd mentioned to me that you're working to help someone still in danger there yourself. So can you talk a little bit about how the risks for local journalists differ in these conflict situations? Absolutely. The risks are different in the sense that they are just magnified so much more so for local journalists than say for somebody like me as a foreign journalist being in other countries. I have a US passport and, and the privilege of that is, is, is so high, you know, it's almost as if this, this passport is a key that kind of unlocks my ability to move around the world as I wish. It's not to say that Americans are welcome in every country or that there's no danger for travel, but certainly, I can leave these situations and these countries, whereas local journalists cannot. And one of the things that I'll never forget when the Taliban took over um, Afghanistan once more in August of last year was that one of the journalists who I worked with and trained in 2008 in Kabul sent me a photograph of our class uh, on the last day of class. Um, and he, he sent in his email a very quick note um, that said, teacher, do you remember me? And it was so, it, it really caught me because, you know, 40 years prior to this moment, when my family was in Corvallis, Oregon, building new lives after fleeing the genocide in our country, my father received a letter in the mail after the uh, Khmer Rouge were ousted by the Vietnamese army. Um, and it was a letter by his half brother that said that started with the line, "Brother, do you remember me?" And so, in in a lot of ways, my father's feeling of obligation to help family members come to America has now, forty years later or forty five years later, been echoed in my own feeling of obligation to help others who are in a similar situation, and. The journalist in particular who, who I am trying to help and um, have been able to get support from family and friends to be able to at least um, send him a little bit of money to buy food and, and basics for now. Um, this guy has a double target on his back because he is both Panjshiri and a journalist. And Panjshir, Panjshir, the Panjshir Valley, of course, is the area of Afghanistan that has been the most, um, I would say, combative toward the Taliban. And you know, extremely resistant to the Taliban, and this has historically been the case there. And so, you know, immediately when the Taliban took over, Panjshiri people, anybody who was Panjshiri, like this journalist, were absolutely terrified and continue to be. This journalist I'm helping continues to be in hiding, and it it creates a a, a real dilemma and conundrum for for those of us who are foreigners and have and have gone to countries. To, to report or to help journalists you know, report on their own stories because at the end of the day, we can catch that last flight out of a country. Whereas local journalists cannot, this is their country, they have to stay. And that was also true in, and, and has been true in Cambodia when I worked there. So I'm curious about the journalism training job because when I was getting ready to go to um, Iraq, I, I, I couldn't get any papers to support to like spot, you know, to say I was working for them as a freelancer. I wanted to go to write this novel, but um, because, and they were like, you have to go to this training center and do these things. And I was like, and they're, and they're like, it costs $3,000. And I'm like, I can't, I can't, I'm not, I don't have time for that. I can't do that. I ended up going with a, with a, a really weird, it was a very weird story. I went with the engineering news record, which was a paper published by a magazine published by McGraw Hill, but they had done a lot of reporting out of Iraq. So it was an engineering story, believe it or not. And they gave me my press credentials and I went and I ended up writing a story for the Washington Post. Um, but that was how I got into the country. But I want what, what did I miss by not being able to do the training that, that the Kansas City Star or the Washington Post wanted me to do? 
Well, first of all, with the kind of training that I do, you wouldn't have been able to qualify because the training that I that I do is actually for local journalists. Ah, the so there's so many I trainings work. that I don't it qualify is. for. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Um, I worked with an organization called Internews, and specifically the work that we did was to train journalists in whatever countries we were living in, and specifically conflict and post-conflict countries um, in, in, in various topics of uh, journalism. Uh, sometimes it was political reporting, sometimes it was investigative reporting, um, sometimes it was health reporting or environmental reporting. And um, so the work that I did, or that, you know, as that Internews does, and that I did specifically as what's called a, journal, a resident journalism advisor, is to, is to train local journalists in sort of the, the international standards of journalism. So what does it actually mean to, to, uh, to write, to report and write a fair and balanced news story? What kind of research is required? How many sources should you really get? So that, it was that kind of training. I think the kind of training they wanted me to do was the kind of training that you did in the story. In the in the, we're going to read actually a passage from this where you were you went through a con you did some conflict training when you were in Correct. Afghanistan. That's in the book, right? Okay, it is. Yeah. yeah. Did that work? Was it? Did you feel like that was worthwhile? You know, I think I was so much in shock that if if I had to take any skill that I learned from that moment, I probably would have completely blundered it. Um, that particular training was really meant to help foreigners understand or, or actually uh, operate quickly in, in a moment's notice in, in a very crisis situation. And um, so we were taught things like um, CPR, um, you know, just things like triage, how to even, you know, how to figure out who to save if you're in a position to help save somebody and who not to. Um, but it was, a, it was a pretty intense uh, experience for me. I wonder if you could read a little bit to us from a section of the book that includes that experience. I'd love to do that. Um, there's a chapter in, in my memoir called Afghanistan and it, and it really goes uh, through that little interlude in my life where I decided to go report uh, in a, or be a journalist in a, in a war zone. And this chapter actually stands in juxtaposition to a, a previous chapter in the book in which my family is packing to leave Cambodia and to leave the war. And in this case, I am packing to go to a war. Uh, and so this chapter is Afghanistan. What do you pack for war? You make your best guess and go. You tuck into a suitcase, a pair of black combat boots, tunics tailor-made to fall above the knees, scarves, large and long enough to cover your head. Things you never needed to own until now. Things to make you modest in a country and culture that are not your own. You slip pictures of your family into a side pocket. You bring your camping headlamp and a few loose books. You get there and it doesn't take long. You find yourself running for cover. You hear a blast that shakes the earth, kaboom. To your left, a man clutches an open wound on his chest, slumped against the wheel well of a car on fire. To your right, a woman lies on the road with orphan shoes, broken glass, and chaos everywhere around her. Red heat licks at your arms and face. Every corner you turn, disaster. You freeze, the thing you are told not to do, the thing that is dangerous in war being so afraid or in shock that you are rendered perfectly useless. Keep moving, a voice instructs, triage, triage. If you find no sign of life, move on. The next few minutes become a blur. Check his pulse, make a tourniquet for her wounds, drag those bodies away from the blaze. You scramble from victim to victim, making dubious decisions about who gets to live and who is beyond saving. It's all guesswork deciding who is worth saving. The thought of it makes you nauseous. This isn't real, you repeat. Your mind understands, but your body is already hijacked, tense with things it knows, things that live deep in your bones, like danger and fear and the undertow of anguish that follows. You were told about this day in a memo your supervisor sent out, this is hostile environments awareness training, a fake war professionally built within a real war so, so that you can practice how to exit alive. 
As your colleagues chuckle at the chicken blood smeared on faces and spilled onto the floor and the writhing bodies overacting in pain, you stand numb at their side. An ancient pain blooms in your body. Fight, flight, or freeze. Your body goes berserk, your legs twitchy, your fists clenched, your stomach churning, churning. You will have nightmares for weeks after the simulation, your body incapable of calm. You flew into Kabul one week before, in the dead of winter, the airplane's wingtips gliding past the snow-covered Hindu Kush mountain range, a natural fortress around Kabul rising above the buildings and homes hidden behind fortified high walls and protected by heavily armed men toting AK-47s over, over their shoulders. Everywhere you glance, guns. You arrived at a city on lockdown into a country convulsing with war. The blank black of the night sky zipped open by rocket grenades. You watch out the window on your way to work. Men rushing across dirt roads, hardened by freezing temperatures wrapped in patushals, hunched against the cold. Women in burkas slinking quietly by in between mud brick homes, dragging their children who disappear in drapes of blue fabric behind them. Where you live, ice encases the road, ice encases the rose hips of your landlady's rose bushes like amber, and you wonder how will they survive? You came here to work with some of the country's top journalists in a program to help build their skills at investigating corruption within governmental institutions. You came here to understand a little bit of what your parents might have felt running from the war in Cambodia. But that was just an easy surface story you told. You really came here to hide, letting a real war distract from the one raging inside you. You don't yet know how terrible an idea this is. You learn. Your life here is simple. You have a room in a home you share with your friends, Pauline and Bernie, in a compound set behind a tall yellow gate. Your landlady, Naja, lives in a house behind you and servants' quarters are opposite her. Naja is a granddaughter of Afghanistan's last king, Mohammed Zahir Shah, robust with a nest of jet black hair, and she will welcome you with a warmth of a million suns, and you will feel safe and content as you dig into her feast on your first day in her country. Kabuli rice, mutton curry, lentil stew, and a slab of flatbread the size and shape of a snowshoe. You go to bed that first night considering the door, the window, which way to exit the fastest in case of a bombing or, or a raid. In the morning, you will get a text. Bomb threats are high. Your boss gives you a choice. Go to the office or work from home. You go to the office where your Afghan colleagues are. You did not come to a war zone to stay at home. You carry your Khmer passport when you leave for work, leaving your US passport behind. You hide who you are. It is safer to be Cambodian than American. And it is one of the first times you will realize how glad you are to be both. Back home in your room, your thoughts drift to the journalists you worked with in Cambodia and the ones who were murdered at Dual Slang Prison during the genocide. You think about your mother running away from her marriage only to get tangled up in a war. You think about the female students in your program, how you want to be like them. You want to be that brave. But that is not what you are feeling the day you go to work and the war has arrived at your doorstep. Taliban fighters and Afghan government troops are battling in the foothills directly across the street. You watch from your second floor office window as billows of smoke rise up from the creases in the hill, explosions rattling your windows, shaking your files to the floor like autumn leaves butterflying to your feet. The office administrator rushes into your room, her words spitting out fast as a machine gun fire. Dut, 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 dut. What is she saying? You ask your translator, Enayat. But he didn't hear, or he was distracted, or he is scared. You say it again. What the hell is she saying? She said, two children have died in the crossfire. We should prepare to go to the bomb shelter. 
The administrator paces up and down the hallway. Do we need to move? Enayat will ask her. Just tell us if we need to move. Enayat is the calmest person you have ever met, but his voice in that moment is scored with panic. You start to panic too. You want instructions to be told what to do because your mind gets stuck in situations like this under duress. You don't move until someone tells you to move. The explosions shake the earth and you feel them vibrate in your core. You keep typing, keep telling yourself you have a training to conduct tomorrow. You have journalists who depend on you. You have Pauline who will make you cardamom coffee in the morning and Bernie, a, a Canadian armed forces officer who will protect you. You have tomorrow, you have tomorrow, you have tomorrow. You build for yourself this kind of story with a future when you are scared, because it is the only thing that makes you feel less afraid. You make a shelter of hope to hide in. Thank you very much. Um, you know, your book is, connects your history as a refugee to your career as a journalist, as you did in, 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 the, uh, in the opening comments to the reading. I was thinking about a particular passage from your memoir when you are back home, by, by, by back home, I mean back home in your mother's country, um, and you visit a Khmer Rouge um, torture facility that's become a museum. And I wonder, to, to some extent, you know, if that, if reporting on the horror of war, desire to do that could have been connected to that moment. I think that absolutely it was. Um, when I look back, I, I see the dots so clearly connected in that way. That moment when I was 16 years old, the very first time I visited Cambodia and I was, I was with my mother. When we, re, when we got a tour of Dual Slang Torture Prison, which was a, um, a, a high school in the middle of Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia, turned um, torture prison by the Khmer Rouge, where uh, roughly 18,000 uh, people were tortured to death. Uh, among the, the people who died at Dual Slang were journalists. And it was at that moment in the, in the tour when the tour guide told us that journalists had died there uh, that, that I, I know looking back changed my life forever. It was knowing that during the genocide, the Khmer Rouge regime specifically targeted journalists because brutal things happen in the dark. And if there are no journalists in the country to tell what is happening, that meant that Popot and his regime could do as they wished. And indeed they did. Two million people died in my country. Um, but there's another piece of that too. The world looked away from Cambodia. And I think that when, when I think back on that time and, and my trajectory to, be, to becoming a journalist and ultimately my trajectory to getting to Afghanistan, I hold that as a very deep wound inside of myself, that the world looked away when there was a genocide in my country, as well as the journalists in Cambodia were targeted so no information could get out. And I thought, I cannot in my conscience ever let this happen again, to look away. Um, and, and I think that that is really one of the key motiv motivators for me to become a journalist is that this is, this is what journalists do. We, we go places and we, we, we report on things regardless of the danger because we're there to bear witness. And in, in a lot of ways, and I, I really believe in the, the core tenet of journalism as to give a voice to the voiceless. You know, if we have the, abil the ability to expose these injustices and the brutalities of these regimes, then we have to, because I don't think we, I, I don't, I really don't think that um, we can bear to look away anymore. How, may, how much more human catastrophe can, can we watch? And I think that that's one of the actual, when I think about um, how heartbreaking to see all of the news coming out of Ukraine, on the other hand, how incredible to see how much news coming out of Ukraine, right? So it's like the fact that there is so much coverage Make, gives is the thing that gives me hope that there possibly could be a, a better ending to the story in Ukraine. It's I, interesting also to see that um, I feel like I've both seen and heard 
um, conversations from people, conversations and comments from people who I think feel very deeply for Ukrainians and are watching what is happening um, with great sympathy and who also are watching the way that this coverage compares to coverage of other places and feel that it is quite racialized, um, that it is, that it's marked in certain ways, um, you know, and there was someone put together like a compilation, which I'm sure if I can find it, I'll put it in the show notes, but just sort of all of these people saying, um, but these people are quote unquote, just like us, um, right? No, this is civilized Europe. Um, and, um, it's interesting to try to like sort of feel within myself like this struggle to, first of all, I mean, of course, like watching watching it, how could you not be completely horrified? Um, and yet also to sort of um, tick back in my own head, all of the things that were not approached this way. Absolutely. I mean, just very uh, recently, we can look at Burma and the conflict that's happening there. And you know, there was a blast of news right off the bat, but then that has really died down. And I think, you know, what, what's been interesting to observe as a journalist watching Ukraine being covered is that the news coverage is consistent. It's consistent and it's persistent. And that's and that wasn't the case in other countries um, where, you know, not surprisingly, brown or black people are from. I uh, the, When you talk about the desire to tell stories and give voice to the voices, I mean, that was... That was the reason that I uh, wanted to go to Iraq because I was opposed to the war and I wanted to participate in criticizing it, to be honest. I mean, I thought, and I, and I had, had and as I've talked to other, other or had friends who were, who were affected in bad ways by the Gulf War. Um, and so, okay, but when I was there, before I went, especially, I would, I, and, and then when I was like going to do something that I thought might be d- dangerous, of which there were many things to do, um, I would think, you're an idiot. You're arrogant for thinking that you should give voice to the voiceless. You should be at home writing about the suburbs. What are you going to tell your kids? You know, I had a very young son when I went the first time. You're going to tell your son that you were giving voice to the voiceless when you end up dead and he doesn't have a father. I mean, that there was another side to that for me that was extremely difficult and not very romantic, right? And and that I and that you you write about exactly the same thing in, in the passages that you read. And I I wondered if you felt that too, like, yes, okay. I mean, I, I had to keep checking, like, this is a thing I'm doing and this is why I'm doing it. But there were times, and this, even for me afterwards, because I had problems writing the book, when I was like, I shouldn't have done it. You know, I, I talk about, um, I, I absolutely, with everything you say, I, I feel that echo inside of me as well. I talk about um, how I was not in Afghanistan for long, but I was there long enough. And what I realized only after the fact was exactly that, how stupid a decision it was. But I'm also of two minds of that. Um, because one of the things that I, that I do wonder about myself, and I'm, I, I don't have the answer yet, um, but it remains a question, is that for those of us who come from experiences and countries of war, are we just perpetually drawn to conflict? Is there something in us that needs us because it needs that because that is what we know. And, but what I realized too, is that when we make decisions as writers or as journalists or as artists to go to another country in these very um, dangerous and fragile situations and volatile situations, the decision that we are making also impacts so many other people in our lives. It impacts our families, it impacts our friends, if we have children, it impacts our children. At the time I was in Afghanistan, I, I, um, I don't have children and I didn't have a, a, a spouse, but my decision to go there impacted my mother particularly, uh, I think the greatest, because what she told me before I left was, we took you safely from war. Why do you wanna go back to that? And what I found out later was that while I was in Afghanistan for those four months, she called my, one of my aunts practically every day and cried, just terrified for me. And similar, same with my siblings. They were worried to death. I, I don't think I could make that decision again. It's, I think it's too hard. I, it's, it's not a decision that we make where the consequences are ours to bear alone. No, the, the sadness of something does happen to us. And the grief of that is something that is borne by and must be carried by our family and friends. 
I don't know, Sugi, I don't think you know this, but um, somebody sent me a CNN clip of Matt Gallagher, who was in Iraq, uh, I'm sorry, in Ukraine, training uh, soldiers. Uh, he's a guy, who, he's a writer who's been on this show twice. And I just thought, oh, fuck, don't do that. <laughs> you know, I really did. I'll tell him that. He'll be upset when I say that. But he probably felt the same way, you know, but uh, he, he mentioned that he had a he has a very young son, you know, and, I, and I, 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 I'm sure there are lots of extenuating circumstances. He was in Lviv and they're already out, you know, because they didn't run the film. But I just there's a scary part to it that, that I always want to make sure everyone understands, you know. It, it's really yeah. scary. Well, Lindsay Adario has children. And when she was interviewed about being in Ukraine, I'll never forget, um, she was asked um, something along the order of, um, I can't quite remember the question, but it was something in the spirit of, was it worth being there? And what she respond, how she responded was, I thought, so telling. She said, I don't know, ask me in three months. Ask me when I, you know, when I can be reunited with my family. And um, because we don't fully know the consequences of our decisions to enter these kinds of situations until long after the fact. It's been 14 years since I left Afghanistan and I'm still dealing with the PTSD from it. That chapter that I read earlier was the very last chapter to be revised in the book because of the fact that I hadn't yet reconciled that experience. I just kind of shoved it under, you know, deep inside because it was it was, it was too painful and emotional to, to deal with that moment in my life. I just didn't deal with it. Um, but you know, that PTSD manifests in different ways. And now it's, um, it, it impacts my relationship um, with my wife um, in different ways. And so those are the kinds of sort of aftershocks that follow when we make these kinds of decisions. I was gonna ask you, um to talk a little bit about um, PTSD. I think that there's, I mean, I don't think that we talk about it enough in general. Um, and I think that a lot of the discourse about it in this country, I mean, for logical reasons, um, is connected to the military. But as you were talking about, journalists experience it too. Um, and there are some really valuable resources for that. I know that um, like I'm on the the center, the, the DART Center um, at Columbia, which is, um, has a lot of resources related to journalists and trauma. Um, but I don't know that, and, and certainly like, I think, you know, fiction writers um, and creative writers have, are also engaging in research where sometimes I don't know that we always have the language or the tools to think about um, the things that we have seen. Um, and sometimes, especially in other genres, like you're not even necessarily saying that you saw it. So um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how you, have coped with that um, after coming back, what tools do you think there are? And Whitney, I'd be curious to hear you talk about this too, because I know that that's something that has affected you as well. Sure. Uh, you know, it was hard for me to transition back to the US after I left Afghanistan. And within that first year, I remember uh, I landed back in Portland, uh, close to my folks. And I remember going to Safeway um, in my neighborhood grocery store to just pick up bread and the bread aisle probably had 80 kinds of bread. And I just had an absolute breakdown and started crying and sobbing for no reason. Well, I mean, I say for no reason, but you know, the reason was I'd come from a country where there was one option of bread, flat bread. And here I was in America with 80 different kinds of bread. And I felt my privilege so deeply in that moment. And so I remember calling my sister and my sister said, you know, put calm down just why don't you go home? Do you need the bread right now? Just go home and kind of breathing, you know, taking, taking a lot of deep breaths and reminding myself I'm not there anymore, you know, and I'm, I'm fine. I'm okay. And I'm safe. And, you know, the, the PTSD emerges, it, it's almost like you're ambushed by, um, by the PTSD, you know, a car will backfire and I'll hit the floor still. Uh, July, uh, 4th of July is very problematic for me. So my wife will put, um, uh, ear canceling headphones on me and we'll go to the basement um, for the night of 4th of July. Um, anything to sort of mitigate um, the, the impacts because any loud sound um, really sends me into a tailspin. And so she'll announce before she's about to, you know, whack a fruit in half and in the kitchen or something. If she knows that there's going to be a loud sound, she'll announce it. And, 
you know, I think about how all these kinds of adaptations came about in order for me to find my sense of calm again. And I think that is the one thing that PTSD and, and trauma in general sort of messes with you is that it completely throws you off balance. You begin to wonder if you will ever just feel calm again. Um, and so with the help of, you know, just really fantastic therapists now, actually, I'm starting to really understand um, how deeply, not just Afghanistan, but the different layers of trauma has impacted my life and manifested. And so that's been really fantastic um, just to be able to start working through some of that. Um, but I'd be curious too, Wit, about your experiences um, because, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, active war zone, uh, there, you probably experienced very similar things that I did with bombings and shootings and all sorts of things. Yeah, Iraq in, in 2006 was particularly bad. Um, you know, they got off the plane uh, in the Baghdad International Airport, walked into a subway, which was connected to the military side of the airport. And there was like a young kid walked in crying and his friend had just gotten blown up at a gate, you know. I mean, you could hear mortar fire, you could hear gunfire uh, to get from where I landed on the plane to get, get my press pass. I had to ride on like this rhino, they called it. It was like a, an armored bus that, so the walls had been thickened so much that it was only room for two seats, you know, and <laughs> and, and we had to drive at 3 a.m. with like Black Hawk helicopter escorts. And, you know, you knew things were bad. And my, the guys that I was with, the job that I was reporting on were guys who went to look for IEDs. So you knew that was going to be bad. Now I did not get hit by an IED, but, you know, the unit that I was with uh, got me out of the convoy that was looking for them right before they got hit in an area that they thought were dangerous, I'm sure, to protect me. Fortunately, only the blasting cap went on off, off on that IED and nobody was injured, but there were 20 soldiers in that battalion that were killed over the summer that, uh, that summer of 2006. And so, but for me, it wasn't um, physical triggers like you were talking about. I just had massive anxiety that mostly about, and it was like, it was like a repetition of like, I'd had a lot of anxiety about going in. It's like, there was a moment when I could have always decided not to go, right? I could have said, you, you can call up and say, I'm not going, you know, you don't have to go. Unlike soldiers who have to go. And, and I always am re reminded like how much their anxiety has got to be much worse than mine. And the people in the country, the Iraqis and, or in this case, Ukrainians, as we're talking about, you know, nevertheless, it gave me some insight into how they must feel. You know, I mean, I, I just kept having this voice in my head that's saying, you're stupid, you did a stupid thing, you've ruined your life, you're never going to be good at writing, you, you should have, you, it's never going to work. And I just, I quit writing for a couple of years, you know, I had to just like, because I couldn't figure out how to write the book. Every time I wrote the book, I would, I would like replay the anxiety that I had felt when I was in certain combat situations, right? And so you can't write a book with your fist clenched the whole time, you know, it's got to, you got to have be able to have humor and love and feeling in it. And I wasn't able to access that because every time I would access the material, this voice would start up. They'd be like, you're stupid. You're dumb. You did a wrong thing. And, you know, that just took therapy and drugs and to sort of break that cycle for me. Well, I both I appreciate both of you talking about that, which I know is difficult um, and which I think that especially like in this, our country and our world is at a mental health moment where resources are so thin. And also I feel like I'm just seeing people struggle. Um, so I'm glad that we can also talk about the mental health aspect of it. And I'm thinking, as I say that about- All students, those people in Mariupol, imagine that. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, that's um, what we're talking about now. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, and as I, as I think about this also, I'm also thinking about my, my students. Um, Whitney and I both teach in MFA programs. Many of our listeners are emerging writers. Um, and as I'm hearing both of your answers, um, I'm, I'm thinking about that as well. And I'm curious, Patsada, what advice you would give someone considering becoming a foreign correspondent now? Wow, what a question uh, there. <laughs> I just thought I'd end on this way. I note. know, my goodness. Um, Softball. <laughs> right, you, you know, I, I think that the answer to that question lies in a couple of things that, that Whit and I both uh, talked about and, and articulate in terms of how we felt after we made decisions to go to the respective war zones uh, that we, where we went, uh, that, we, that we went to. Um, 
I really am of two minds about this. A part of me wants to tell an emerging writer who wants to be a to become a foreign correspondent, go, absolutely go. Somebody has to tell these stories. But then of course the other part of me, and this is the part um, of me that is years beyond my, my time in Afghanistan, who's looking back now and who's still dealing with the repercussions of making that decision to go. Um, that other part of me wants to say, hold on, <laughs> let's, let's wait a minute here. Um, are you sure you wanna do this? Because it's not just that immediate decision to, to go to a conflict zone or to go to, to another country as a reporter. That decision is gonna ricochet throughout the rest of your life. And are you prepared uh, to live with the consequences of that decision? Um, because it's because they're not easy and even if even if um writers don't go to conflict zones and you you are a foreign correspondent i guarantee you no matter what country you go to there's going to be conflict of some sort or another there are very few countries in our world today that are really i would say you know have 100 percent peace and um there's just a lot of reconciliation that that you have to do and you have to live with and also can you live with how your decision is going to impact people who love you and people who you love. Yeah, I would echo all those things. I guess that I would say to them, is there a way that you can figure out not to do this? And if you can't, okay. You know, I think in the end, for me, I couldn't figure out a way not to do what I was doing. Um, and it sounds like that was true for you as well. I think it was with, and, and one last thing I will, I will say about that is that very often, this is true for, for me, I, I see both as a writer and as a journalist, that part of me feels deeply compelled to do this. It's, it's almost as if it's not even a decision. There's just some other force that's working behind the scenes to say, you're meant to tell these stories. You're meant to go to these places. Well, thank you so much, Patsada, for joining us today um, for this conversation. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to you, too, for sharing some of these thoughts. And listeners, we encourage you to order, uh, to pre-order, actually, um, Putsada's unforgettable memoir, um, which is called Ma and Me. And it will be out in mid-May. Um, and we will have a link in our show notes. Putsada, It's really you. good. It's really good. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. This was such a fantastic conversation.